मैम यू आर ऑन म्यूट Thanks, Sid. Sorry, my mic was muted. Uh, welcome, everyone, for today's session. Even before we could start, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Jeffina, would you like to pray? Anyone else would like to pray? Brother Abu Bakar, you would like to pray? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Please. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We glorify your name for this hour. Thank you for our class. Thank you for our teacher. Thank you for the student. We bless your name. We see that exalted in Jesus' name. We commit our class into your hand. Father, have your way. Take proper control. Teach us yourself from above in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'm just setting my camera right. Okay. So, how was your weekend? How did you all spend your weekend? Okay, I see a complete silence there. Mom, um, weekend well, okay. well, in ministry. The weekend went well. Wow, that's nice. Uh, nice to hear and also see uh, how you serve along with your dad, Sid. That's nice. Um, okay. So today we are going to study on the book of which many scholars believe that it is the greatest book in the entire Bible. Which is that book? It is the book of, book of Romans. Romans. Yes, brother. Thank you. It is the book of Romans. The book of Romans is also known as the book of justification. Okay. Please make a note. Okay, as we discuss on this book, there's so much to learn and share from this one book. I would request you all, please make a note. So the Roman book known as Book of Justification. So what do we know? Who's the author of this book? And what do we know about this author? Class, let's keep it interactive. Just unmute, share, talk. There's... Uh, don't worry, uh, it won't be a wrong answer. Just share what you know. Ma'am, Paul? Yes, Apostle Paul was the author. Okay, so what do you know about Apostle Paul? He is a Jew writer who changed his name to a Gentile name from Shaul to Paul. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? Would like to add? Ma'am, from a Christian persecutor, he became a Christian preacher and missionary. Super. That is one of my points that I would want to share. That's really nice, Sid. Thank you. From a persecutor to a preacher. That's nice. Yes, Brother Lubega, you would like to share? was a member of the uh, something something like that he was a member of sorry I didn't get that the, the seven he was among the 70 he was in a group of the the 70 sc scholars okay. who were in Jerusalem yeah. mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay okay thank you for sharing that <clears throat> well the book of Romans was the first of many books written by Apostle Paul. So Paul wrote at least 13 letters of uh, 13 letters, that is the epistles of 27 books in the New Testament. So the books range in size. Okay, some uh, some letters like the letter to Philemon was about one chapter. And the other books were about 16 chapters or less than that, varies, okay? So most of 
these books are uh, the epistles or the letters we call it to the individuals or to the church including uh, including with a greeting or uh, the message was all about greeting or addressing or exhortation admonitions or uh, some of the some of the letters were about the doctrinal instructions and personal information and it it ended with a salutation and we also th see through uh, from the book of acts like initially he was addressed as saul of tarsus and then later he continued with the name of paul so what is this saul and paul um, did he change his name after his encounter with jesus or how did this name change happen Yes, brother Lubega, go ahead. I think he was. I think he was both a, a Jew and a Roman citizen, because uh, in in Jewish he was called Saul. But uh, when you look at his Roman citizenry, this is Paulus, something something like that. Paulus, which means I think Paul. I think there was yes. that. Jesus never thank told you. Thank you, brother Lubega. Yes, that's right. That's right. So Saul was his Jewish name and Paul was his Roman name. So both was his name, nothing to do with the encounter, but then both were his name. So Paul was born in Tarsus. We see that in the book of Acts, chapter 22, verse 3. That was his original name, the Saul of Tarsus. And Paul was also born as a Roman citizen. Okay, in the same chapter, when we continue to read down, we see that Paul was a Roman citizen and Paul was a, a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. These are certain things that we need to remember. Paul was a Jew from the Benjamin tribe and he was educated in Jerusalem under, under the leader Gamaliel, a teacher of considerable reputation in both in secular and in religious world. And he was fluent in at least three languages, which were the common language that they spoke during that time. Anyone can share? Aramic. Okay, one of the language. Which are the other two? Greek. Yes, one more to go. It was also good in mm -hmm. Latin. Okay, Sid, what do you say? I'm Hebrew. Hebrew and Brother Lubaika said Latin. Good. All, all are right. Okay. He was fluent at least three to four languages. That's what the history says. One was Greek, Hebrew, Aramic, and possibly he also knew Latin. So he was trained as a Pharisee. When we read the book of Phi, uh, Philippians, we see that um, he was trained as Pharisee. And we also see he's been groomed for the Sanhedrin in the book of Galatians, we see that. And Paul became zealous opponent of Christianity. How we know that? Because he was a key player in the death of the first martyr. Who was the first martyr? Stephen. Stephen. We see that again in the book of Acts last week. Stephen was the first martyr and he was a key player. in that incident and and he also became a lead persecutor of the church and he received the letters from the authority uh, to imprison all the christians and that's why with that letter he headed towards damascus and we later we know the story of how he had a personal encounter with jesus he also participated in a lot of tortures, the trials, and the death of many Christians. And uh, he was the instrumental for scattering of the uh, uh, of uh, scattering the seed of the New Testament church, where people, uh, uh, you know, they were scared of him and they flee to different places. With that, we also see after his encounter with Jesus, we see that Paul who was a persecutor, now become a preacher. Paul was a good candidate for salvation. And sometimes people uh, that resist 
uh, you know we see from his lifestyle we we can say that people that resist the most becomes the most zealous for the truth we see in acts uh, 9 uh, how paul transformed from being a persecutor to become a preacher and uh, just not a preacher like the common man but then he was very zealous to carry the word to the uttermost part of the world despite even if it uh, you know even if it cost his life he was on the journey to share and teach the word And um, yes, we're studying on the book of Romans, but then we need to know a little bit background about Paul. So where do we see the background? Yes, we see from the book of Acts. So when we turn to Acts 9. And this experience and this preparation to the ministry. So Paul was confronted on the uh, road to Damascus, Paul was, Paul was confronted by Jesus while he was, uh, he was on his way to kill all the Christians there. Paul was, <clears throat> after that incident, uh, you know, um, Paul was commissioned by Ananias. He had to meet him. And then uh, we know the story how his sight was restored back to him. Paul preached briefly in Damascus. He just shared his experience with Jesus, his encounter with Jesus, with the people, uh, the Christians who were there, and, uh, who were meeting in the underground churches. And he spent uh, about three years in Arabia. Then uh, he attempted to join the disciples at Jerusalem where he met Barnabas. This is the first time that Paul is meeting Barnabas at Jerusalem. And later, after a lot of commotion and he's been rejected and a lot of death threats, he, he turned to uh, he returned to Tarsus, all the disciples and all sent him, sent him to Tarsus. And, uh, you know, and there he continued to be a tent maker. And we don't know much what happened there. But after about, you know, some scholars say 10 years, some of them say 14 years. But after 14 years or after 10 years, 10 to 14 years, uh, he was remembered by Barnabas. God made Barnabas to recollect about Paul when there was a need at the church of Antioch of Syria. So here we see in the later chapter, we see uh, in the later chapter of Book of Acts, we see how uh, Barnabas went in search of Paul he went in search of Paul to bring him so that he can assist in the ministry. That's how God sends. God sends to each of us somebody like Barnabas to call us back into the ministry. And later part, when we study the book of Acts, Acts 11, we see how Paul assisted Barnabas in laying the foundation of church at Antioch. Then we also see how Paul accompanied him in the ministry. He, he went on the first missionary journey with Barnabas and he collected the offering for the famine relief. And then we see how, uh, you know, uh, 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 Barnabas, John, Mark and Paul went on the first missionary journey. And uh, when we were studying on the Gospel of Mark, we, uh, we learned about John Mark, how he was so scared with the things uh, happening around him and he was not ready or prepared enough. So he had to leave Paul and Barnabas off the way in the first missionary journey and he returned back. Which uh, brought a drift uh, in the second missionary journey between Paul and Barnabas. They had an argument of which they both uh, were separated and they went towards a different journey. So we, uh, yeah, the Acts, the book of Acts says that Paul and uh, um, Paul took Silas and also Timothy and he went on the second missionary journey to the places as a follow-up to where they ministered in the first missionary journey. And later we also see Barnabas taking John Mark and going towards the journey on a different way. But yes, not much of what uh, Paul and uh, not not much of what Barnabas and John Mark would have gone. Those are not been recorded. But then 
the places that Paul visited and Paul ministered to the churches and to the individuals have been recorded as the epistles to us, has been added as an epistle in the New Testament. We see uh, the different missionary journeys. The first missionary journey, yes, was initiated by Barnabas. And the second missionary journey, as I said, uh, they, uh, Paul took Silas and Timothy. And in the third missionary journey, uh, yes, it was a follow-up and also the extension. This time, uh, Paul takes uh, Silas and Timothy and he broke new ground in the place called Ephesus. So this journey ended up with uh, Paul and his team in Jerusalem presenting a relief offering for the Gentile church. Um, <clears throat> at the end of Book of Acts, we also see Paul's arrest, death, and other traditions. So when we talk about uh, the death and uh, the arrest and death, yes, the Romans were very good at it. In fact, under the reign of Nero, let me share the presentation that I have here. Please give me a minute. It projected. Are you able to see? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so <clears throat> let me go to the presentation. Okay, the book of Romans we see, and here I kept here. Yeah, so the Christians were persecuted under the Roman Emperor Nero. So uh, some Christians were uh, were. We uh, we attacked by the wild beast. This is the uh, Colosseum, which is present in the Rome, and all the people of Romans have been seated here, watching what's happening to the believers, what's happening to the Christians, the new sect of Christians who believe on Jesus. So uh, the Roman Emperor thought uh, these new set that is growing very rapidly. Uh, uh, you know, are being a threat to them. They were asked to worship the Roman gods. They were asked to do the customs which the Roman uh, did, the traditions they asked to follow, to worship the Roman and the Greek gods, which the Christians, the new believers who believed in Jesus, refused to do so. So in accord to that, you know, they were punished. They were arrested, they were persecuted, they arrested, and then they were, uh, you know, they made a spectacular watch to the people so that they thought by doing so, they will bring an end to Christianity. So they caught all the Christian believers, they let the wild beast to come and attack them, as we see in this picture. And also we see some of them were crucified. I just selected this picture. I'm not too sure whether all three incidents happened together at one time or it happened in three different ways. But then here in this picture, I could cover all three different trials which the Christians underwent during the Roman Emperor Nero. So we see uh, the Christians were attacked by the wild beast and we see some of them were crucified on the cross and some of them were lit as a torch in this place. And this is some of the ways where the Christians were tortured in those days in the time of Paul and Peter. So what did they do? The history says that... Uh, Uh, history says that Paul's death was unknown, but the tradition holds that he was beheaded in Rome and thus died as a martyr for his faith. So we see that his death was part of the executions of the Christians ordered by the Roman Emperor Nero, which uh, the reason was for following the great fire in the city. This incident happened about 64 um, 
yeah 64 ad uh, but then um, what we see here is uh, the roman uh, the some of the tradition says that the fire was set by the romans itself but they blamed the christians just for the reason to persecute them to uh, to kill them so they thought they will bring the end to the leaders so they caught peter and paul so peter as he was also uh, as he was the leader so they actually uh, wanted to crucify peter so peter we see that he uh, as uh, he requested that his cross will be upside down as uh, peter personally felt that he was unworthy of being crucified just in the same manner as they did to jesus so he requested them to uh, you know crucify him upside down when he received the sentence of death and yes both of them was a martyr in the christian church they died this way during the reign of nero yeah so this is what i want to share so with this we see that um, some incidents that is happening even in our time we see that the history been repeated it's not something new but then there's an history been repeated in our time as well so just to go back okay to go back what happened before uh, paul was beheaded he was arrested in jerusalem by the romans so paul was arrested in jerusalem by the romans and he stood trial before the sanhedrin and we see uh, he was rescued paul was rescued by rome and sent to caesarea where he stood trial in front of uh, different leaders like felix and agrippa and uh, his trial uh, is uh, sentence to death was delayed of over 2 years and paul was realizing his inability to get a fair trial so we see that he appeals to rome in acts 25 he appeals to rome and we also see how paul traveled to rome as a prisoner on ship and we see the shipwreck scene and how uh, they were rescued on the island of malta and how he ministered to people there you know some of the things may not be understood then to paul but later when we read the book we see how god's hand was upon paul how god continue to minister even in the prison even when paul was in the prison the spreading of gospel was not stopped even when he reached the island of malta the very instant of an uh, viper uh, uh, you know a uh, they thought that paul may die but then through that god's name was glorified he could reach the gospel to the people of malta and he could minister to them see healing in uh, in the people who were there and then paul also we also see that how paul ministered to the uh, to the soldiers in the ship they started believing him the prisoner became the leader dictator in the ship what needs to be done what needs uh, you know how we can rescue everyone you know he took the leadership even there god always made him the head and not the tail and also in in rome paul was put in a, a put, a put in his own rented house and even there how he continue to minister to people who personally visited him he continue to write letters from that place you know um, the ministry did not stop with the trial of paul but it just continued we also see uh, even in this place how paul continued to write the epistles he wrote first timothy titus uh, during this period and we also see how um, you know at all time how personally he could meet people visit people minister to them and god, uh, god continued uh, to talk to people through paul and the book of romans to whom was this book written anyone from the class
and what was the purpose of writing the book? I think it was written to the Christians who were in Rome, and yes. uh, it was and it was basically written for either doctrinal purposes or for to prepare his visit to Rome. Correct, correct. While uh, we learn from the book of Romans itself that Paul wrote this book to the believers who made up a church, who built a church in Rome and were living there. And Paul had never visited this Roman church before. But he's writing a letter to them and expecting to visit them sooner. And he had a great respect for this church. And even they had a great honor for Paul. And yes, but uh, it is not difficult to see why the Christians from the Roman church uh, met Paul with such great affection while he finally came to Rome as a captive. And what was the very purpose of writing this book? To show that salvation is, is to both Jews and Gentiles alike. Okay. Yes, you're right, brother. <clears throat> While we see that there was a debate about the purpose of writing this book, Paul wrote this book. Well, a couple of things that has been noted, I would like to share it here. Uh, we know from the book of Acts that the church in Rome had existed for some time that uh, it was made up of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Christ. But at one point, the Roman emperor, Claudius, had expelled all the Jewish people from Rome. And then, about uh, because they had a kind of fear, like where these Jewish Christians are, uh, are increasing. So he expelled them. And then about five years later, after the death of Claudius and the edict that he, that he issued expired, and then we see the Jews, including the believers, allowed to return back. And they did. And when they did come back, they found a church that had become very non-Jewish in custom and in practice. So this created a lot of tension in the church believers. So that uh, uh, Paul's day, the Roman church was divided between the Jewish and non-Jewish people. And there were a lot of tension and disagreement happening between them. Uh, they were debating about the traditions, about the circumcision or about the Sabbaths that they kept and they celebrated and many other traditions they always debated between themselves. So Paul is writing this letter to accomplish few things. And he wanted uh, this church to be united uh, 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 united on a very practical ground. So he was hoping that the Roman church would become a staging ground for his mission to go even further west all the way to Spain. So we see that these circumstances uh, are what motivated Paul to write out his fullest explanation of the gospel, the good news that he wanted to announce or he wanted to share with them about the life of Jesus' death and resurrection. One thing when we see that uh, whichever letter we read, despite the situation, there is one message that Paul is reiterating it again and again and again. That is the gospel of Christ. Very clearly, no matter what problem he is addressing, but he is addressing about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So with that, the letter is designed to have four main uh, movements or parts uh, that is there in this book. So what is that? One, we see to prepare the uh, future visit. Second, we also see to strengthen the foundation of the church. How? So chapter 1 to chapter 8, we see to strengthen the concept of salvation is by faith. And chapter 9 to 11, he emphasizes the spiritual heritage over the natural heritage in God's tree of faith. 
and chapter 12 to 15 he focuses on the practical expression of the christianity that must be resulted in faith so it is one thing to be doctrinal sound and it is another thing to put our faith into practice and demonstrate god's love in practical ways and the last chapter 16 um he is greeting phoebe and uh, and also the other saints in the church yeah and this letter was taken by phoebe to the church in romans so what is the main message of this book anyone from the class what is the main message what do we learn from the book of romans and why is it uh, scholars say it is one of the greatest theological book that we need to know i think you said it is a book of justification when you are beginning yes. the, the lesson yes yes that's right brother so the key verse in the book is the righteousness of god the words righteousness and justification occurs over 60 times in this book so the righteousness with god becomes the main theme of this book with that being said we also see a leader in the church martin luther was also impacted by the very verse on uh, chapter 1 verse 17 which says the just shall live by faith this verse impacted martin luther towards the reformation in the church so as we study the chapters from chapter 1 to 4 it talks about the righteousness that is required that is required for us and from chapter 5 to 8 we see righteousness been received how we can receive the righteousness he, paul lets us know that the only hope for a man is if god himself provides for man's righteousness and it demonstrates that christ has acquired this on our behalf by his work on the cross and that we have the access for this gift of righteousness how how do we have the access for the gift of righteousness it's only by faith in jesus christ and the work that he did on the cross and from chapter 9 to 11 we see righteousness rejected here we see how paul expresses his love for his own jewish people and how they were used of god to preserve a seed and the word of god for the rest of the world but he also makes it clear that god has one tree of faith made up of both jews and gentiles and the jewish branches that rejected christ were cut off of the tree of faith and the gentiles who received jesus as the lord and savior were grafted into the tree of faith how well he explains it here so the way into the tree is through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He also says the way out of the tree is only through the unbelief. So our unbelief removes us from the tree of faith. Despite you may be a Jew or a Gentile, you have no access into that if we have unbelief and from chapter 12 to 16 we see that the righteousness been revealed here we see that paul turns a major doctrine of bible into the uh, uh, implication of the doctrine and he allows us to focus on how these things we call it as faith should affect our life well paul um, you know he focuses on the practical side of christianity and what it actually means to display the righteousness of christ in our relationship with each other and the world so with that 
we can go towards the unique feature. So what is the unique feature? What are some of the unique features that we find in this book? Yeah, y'all can refer your notes and give out some points. So it... Okay, the class is very quiet. I would request you all to please go through, brush up the notes. So as you all sh share, you would know, okay, these are the things that has been shared in the class is already present in our notes. Okay. So yes, we talk about justification. It is the process by which God declares us not guilty based on the acceptance of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We also see propitiation, which has been noted in Romans 3, 25. Propitiation. Can I request one of us to read Romans 3, 25? Sid, you would like to read? Can I read? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, Romans 3.25 God gave Jesus Christ to the world. Men's sins can be forgiven through the blood of Christ when they put their trust in him. God gave his son Jesus Christ to show how right he is. Before this, God did not look on the sins that were done. Yeah, thank you. So in our NKJV version, it says, and when God set forth as a propitiation, that means Jesus is a mercy seat. Propitiation means Jesus is a mercy seat. So it's a process by which God removes the due punishment for our sin because of the sprinkling of Christ's blood on our behalf. We also see the third point here, redemption in this book. In the same chapter, verse 24, redemption being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We see it's a process again by which Jesus Christ paid the debt that we owe, freeing us from the bondage to sin and death. We also see sanctification in this book, Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Sanctification. We have been sanctified in Christ. It is a process by which the Holy Spirit of God takes the level of our experience in Christ up to match our position in Him. We also see the glorification of Christ in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. We see the glorification of Christ. Again, it is a process, but it is an act of God by which man completes the process of full redemption with his whole spirit, soul, and body, which overcomes the effect of sin and death. So what makes the book of Romans so special? What experience do we get when we read the book of Romans? Some of the key verses that we see when we read the book of Romans is, you know, as we read the book of Romans, we also get to walk the Roman roads of salvation. Okay, some of the key verses that we see through this book is Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what do we see here? All people on earth are sinners. Why is, uh, why is Paul writing this statement? 
to make sure the Jews in the church felt that they were perfect. And there was a tension between the Jews and the Gentiles in the church. So here, Paul is bringing them, listen, all people on earth are sinners. Sin has separated us from God and keeps us from fulfilling our destiny. And he brings them all on the same level ground. And he says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And again in Romans 6, 23, the first part we see that, yeah, we see that for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. So what do we learn here? We see that the scripture verse says the penalty for sin is death. The death that is referred here is both physical and spiritual. So there's an there's also an eternal death that is separation from God himself. So he is bringing an awareness to both of them, Jews and Gentiles. And in uh, 5, 8, chapter 5, verse 8, we see that, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So here we see that God set his love upon us in spite of, of our sinful condition. Here we see Paul bringing a need, like how important, what is our condition, what is our place we are in, and how we need God. Because of God's great love for us, he provided a plan for our condition to be saved. So God, in his holiness, could not simply ignore our sin, but then he sent his only begotten son, John 3, 16, to die and pay our death in our place. And with that, we also move on to chapter 6, verse 23 again. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what we see here, Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, so that he became our sinless substitute. So that in order to receive that gift, we must reach out and accept the eternal life as the gift. We also see in Romans 10, verse 9 to 10. Okay, as we have very less time, so I'm just going through the scriptures. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to 10. What do we see? If you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what do we see here? Christ died on the cross. He made it possible for us to receive the forgiveness of sins. So, this gift of salvation is given to those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and those who agree and accept him as their Lord and Savior. And as we uh, conclude this book, as we conclude this book, I would like to know why this book was so special. Yes, we see many scholars, many leaders, whoever have meditated and read the book of Romans have been convicted, have been impacted. Yes, even Martin Luther was impacted by the very verse, chapter 1, verse 17, which says the just shall live by faith. So it was the book of Romans that inspired him to have a personal relationship with God, to build a personal faith and put that seed in his heart that triggered the reformation and it was uh, uh, it was in uh, luther's commentary on the book of romans that stirred the heart of john wesley and caused him to receive jesus in a personal way yes we also see the truths been found in the book of romans that have served as the basis of faith for all who call upon the name of the lord to many leaders 
So I would request each one of us to please go through the book of Romans so that we, each of us, may be impacted by the word so that we may be uh, justified, be made righteous, and be sanctified in the Lord. I said in a different order. First, we may be justified, sanctified, and be made righteousness in the Lord. So I leave it open for the class to discuss, share what you learned from this book. Please go ahead. So that's the book of Romans that we end this book and we can prepare for the next book tomorrow on 1 Corinthians. So leave this time open for a class to share your learning from this book. What impacted you? Was there anything new that you learned? What touched you? Paul, would you like to share? Yes, please go ahead. Just unmute and speak up. Two words. One is righteousness and two is redemption. Yes, brother. Sid, you would like to share something? John. I hope that I'm audible. Would you like to share something? Lyndon, Paul, John Paul, Sally, would like to add, share. Ma'am, can I say something? Yes, sir. please go ahead. Ma'am, the most fascinating thing about the book of Romans, which I like, like there was, like there was an author by the name of Mr. G.K. Chestron. He wrote in his book, he wrote in his book, like, if there is a situation for the Christians, like they are in a desert and they are very of downtrodden situation. If And only the one book is available from the Bible. Which book they will choose is the book of Romans. Because unlike the rest of the New Testament book, it is not just focusing on the dry theology, but it is also focusing on the revival of the Christian history has faced. <laughs> Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Sid. Anyone? Jeffina, you're very quiet. Are you able to hear? Can you unmute and talk to us? Okay. Okay, I hope this class was helpful, revealing a lot of insights from the book of Romans. And I, I because you're, you're very silent, I, I hope that you all have got the message, you all understood. <clears throat> yeah, I see some of the messages here. That's the way you commute. But I would like you to post messages, ask questions, keep the session interactive so that it's live and interesting. Mm. Okay, as the time is up, let's bring this class to a close. Can I request one of us to please dismiss us in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Yes. Father, we thank you for this wonderful lesson we've had about the book of Romans. God, we know it's by faith that we are satisfied. So Lord, we also do pray for the pastor who has taught us that she has been a vessel. Please, Lord, also send the Holy Spirit to guide us where we've not understood because the Bible says that we shall we won't be left at orphans, but we shall receive the Spirit that will collect us, recollect us, remind us, and even teach us. So Lord, as we're going to post the as we're going to close the lecture, Lord, we pray that tomorrow we meet in peace, but not in peace. We pray in the name of our Father, Jesus Christ, and never will say Amen. 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 
Thank you, Brother Lubega, for praying. Thank you, each one, for joining in today's session. See you all tomorrow. God bless. Thank you.